okay. I think let's start. Welcome everybody. Many thanks for joining us today. This is a, a SEDL webinar held jointly with the International Center for Research on Women on involving men and boys in family planning. And thanks for taking the time to come and join us. I'm Patrick Ward, and the Programme Director for SEDL. I'll be chairing the session today. SEDL is the Centre of Excellence for Development, Impact and Learning. It finances one of the research projects that we'll present today. It's financed by UK aid with money from the British people. Um, I'll be presenting the, the speakers. We will have three sessions uh, with four presenters, and then we'll have space for discussion and questions at the end. Um, so maybe if the speakers, the presenters don't mind uh, sharing their videos, making themselves visible, we'll just briefly introduce the speakers. We have Afni Amin. Yeah, I can see something over here. Aha, uh -huh. Avni Amin from WHO, Technical Officer at the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research at WHO. We have Maria Lohan, Professor of Social Sciences and Health at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University, Belfast. And Anya Aventin, a lecturer at the same School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University. Both of the last two are co-principal investigators on the SEDL Finance Research Project, which they'll be presenting today. And last but not least, we have Ravi Verma, who is the Asia, Asia Regional Director at the International Centre for Research on Women, who are co-hosting this webinar with us today. So thank you for that. Three quick housekeeping points uh, before we move to the presentations. Please share any questions that you have into the Q&A for the panel. And we will, we will come back to those questions at the end. You can add them at any point. You can also vote questions up. And I will try to choose the most interesting and the most popular um, at the end of the, all of the presentations. The webinar is being uh, recorded and it will be on the SEDL website at the end. And, and finally, please complete the post-webinar survey at the end of at the end of the webinar, you'll be directed to it. And it's very helpful for us to get some feedback on how people understand these uh, webinars, how much they appreciate them, a way for us to, to learn and improve. So please do complete it. So thank you very much for joining again. And I will hand over to our first speaker, Avni Amin. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I will just uh, set the, the frame for this uh, panel discussion on family planning and uh, um, male involvement by framing it in the context of some of the efforts uh, we have been doing on uh, masculinities and sexual and reproductive health and really doing a stock taking uh, of the evidence over two decades of work in this space. So I'm just gonna share my screen a minute. So as I was saying, I'll just maybe walk us through uh, last five years of some effort of what WHO and specifically the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research has been undertaking on uh, looking at the evidence on masculinities, men, and uh, in the context of sexual and reproductive health a little bit more critically. Um, and this critical stock taking was started in 2016. Uh, we realized, you know, that there is this increasing mantra around the need to work with men and boys. And of course, the importance of working with men and addressing uh, male involvement was highlighted very much in ICPD and the Beijing Platform for Action on Women. And in the last 20 years, there's been a proliferation of research and programming on men masculinities in some areas of sexual reproductive health. We also now have uh, movements of organizations working on engagement of men becoming more influential in the sexual and reproductive health space in influencing policies. At the same time, over the decades, ha there has been emergence of uh, tensions as well as challenges which need to be acknowledged. So with all of this background in mind, we decided to undertake a critical analysis of what the evidence says, what the gaps are, 
what some of the priorities for research might be and lessons learned in order to inform the next generation of research programming and policy development in this space. When we started this work, we realized that in terms of the conceptual framing, this issue was approached with three different lenses, with three different perspectives. One was around men's health being an important issue in their own right. And here the argument was really around the sex-based differences that were cropping up in men's higher morbidity and mortality as the argument for addressing the gender equity gap in men's health. Another perspective that framed particularly in the areas of maternal and child health family planning and uh, PMTCT was the emphasis on male responsibility in supporting women's reproductive health and recognizing that men played a role as gatekeepers, as decision makers when it came to women's reproductive health. And therefore we needed to work with men and encourage them to be involved in women's reproductive health decisions and care as supportive partners. And then there is a third area, which was also framing a lot of the research and uh, programming, which was the emphasis on changing harmful male norms or masculinities, particularly in the areas of HIV and violence prevention, where it was recognized that these harmful norms, gender norms around masculinities, were really a barrier in terms of preventing the HIV, as well as contributing to high rates of violence against women. So we had to make a decision as to where we wanted to focus our attention, and we decided largely to focus it on the male involvement in sexual reproductive health and addressing masculinities, recognizing that by addressing masculinities, we would also contribute to the agenda on men's health. Over the five years, our purpose really was to inform the next generation of research, expand the knowledge and evidence synthesis, map what the research gaps are, and set a priority research agenda, but also articulate some guiding principles for addressing masculinities and working with men. So in terms of the timeline over the last five years and milestones, we undertook a Campbell review which led to an evidence gap map, a systematic review of reviews on engaging men across different sexual reproductive health topics. This was followed by a systematic review of gender transformative interventions with men. That was also published uh, in 2020. We also held an expert group meeting to start identifying domains and priority research agenda topics. And now we are on, uh, uh, ongoing as part of an ongoing work building on this is we are undertaking a priority research agenda setting exercise. And we will uh, finish it by articulating some guiding principles for addressing this work and a special supplement on this topic with the view to uh, focus on some of the neglected areas in men, masculinities and SRH. This has been a collaboration between WHO and HRP and Queen's University of Belfast with Maria Lohan and her team. And as I said, Campbell Systematic Review Protocol was published as a Campbell collaboration to start off this first step, which was to map the evidence and publish an evidence gap map. And it was published also in the BMJ Global Health in 2019. The systematic review of gender transformative interventions with men and boys built on the, on the previous uh, systematic review of reviews by digging deeper into particular interventions and studies that focused on gender transformative uh, interventions. And we took the definition of gender transformative interventions from the WHO gender mainstreaming manager, uh, gender mainstreaming manual for health managers, focusing on those that address gender norms at the individual or group level, as well as those that try to address unequal gender power relations through structural interventions. The expert group meeting, the objective of that, of that particular exercise, building on these two previous systematic reviews, was to really start culling out and harvesting the approaches and principles to programming that were likely to be gender transformative, start identifying the list of topics, questions, and gaps that needed further research, the outcome measures, study designs that should be used for evaluations to have a more robust evidence base, and the kinds of partnerships that would support innovations in programming and learning. One of the particular areas we explored in that expert group uh, is related to today's uh, focus on family planning. And I'm just uh, presenting some of the topics that were identified by the expert group as 
themes for uh, priority research around men's concerns for family planning and their own use, how contraceptive decisions could be measured as collaborative processes between couples, how uh, we could address masculinities of men who resist contraceptive, trying to unpack contraceptive use of women in diverse relationships, such as partners of men who migrate or polygamous men, understanding masculinity and perceptions of pleasure and its effect on contraceptive use, understanding masculinity in the context of traditional method use, and then unbiasing measurement of contraception from couples and assuming intimacy, heterosexuality, and really expanding to also looking at contraception in non-binary relationships, unpacking masculinities and reproductive coercion, and then really understanding how to shift the paradigm from men as supporters of family planning to men as users of family planning. Also trying to understand how unmarried and uncoupled men understand body literacy because that impacts family planning use. And then trying to understand patriarchal assumptions about men and women's roles in the design and delivery of services. So these are just some pre preliminary themes that emerged and were identified by the experts as topics that needed further research in the space. And finally, we are going to build on some of those themes that were identified by the expert group and now undertake a more collaborative research priority setting exercise this is a collaboration between uh, WHO, Queen's University of Belfast and the Men Engage Alliance. And this will use a participatory Chinri method to identify all of the universe of domains, topics and themes, and then undertake a ranking of the most priority uh, uh, pressing topics that people identify as, as important or urgent. And I'll close here. Thank you very much. Over to you, Patrick. Many thanks indeed, Avni. Um, I would encourage people, please, to add questions to the q and I see we've got one already, and we'll come back to them all at the end. So please do add, add any questions to Avni, and we can come back to them. Uh, and I will hand over to Maria and Nanyi. Thank you. So I hope my slides are sharing OK. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maria Lohan, and together with Anya Venton today, we are going to present this systematic review entitled Involving Men and Boys in Family Planning in Low and Middle Income Countries, a systematic review of complex interventions to identify program components. And this systematic review has been funded by the CEDAW program with funding from UK Aid. And Anya and I will present today on behalf of our, 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 our team as a whole. And just briefly to acknowledge our team, please. Our team is largely composed of academics from Queen's University Belfast and the Women's Health and Action Research Center in Nigeria. And uh, Dr. Martin Robinson, who's there in the second photo was our primary research fellow working on the project. And um, we, we were also joined by a CEDL appointed advisor, Chris Bunnell. And the topics that uh, Anya and I would like to address today in our presentation are very briefly um, the rationale for this study, the central aim of this study, the methods we used, and some of our preliminary findings. So first of all, really to the rationale of the study. And the first question that comes to mind really is the why men question that Abney has also been addressing. And really to address the question, of why men, we first need to acknowledge that the greatest global deficits in sexual and reproductive health and rights lie in relation to women's and girls' rights. So quite rightly, the most necessary and orthodox approach is to invest in both upstream measures and downstream interventions to promote women's and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights. But it's long been acknowledged that men can be both inhibitors or enablers of women's and girls' progress towards sexual and reproductive health and rights. And as Avni mentioned, this was clearly acknowledged at the International Congress of, of um, uh, Population and Development in Cairo some 25 years ago, that there was a need to bring men on board in the policies and programmings to support change for women and girls, as well as to address sexual and reproductive health and rights in men's own lives or inequalities among men, 
or in a nutshell, to support sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. However, in, a, in acknowledging, I suppose, that men can be both enablers or inhibitors of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, the question becomes not just about bringing men on board, but also the promotion of bringing positive masculinities on board to challenge patriarchal control over women and girls' reproductive health and bodies, and in a way that can support sexual reproductive health and rights for all. This brings us to the importance of family planning. Why family planning? Well, family planning is acknowledged as really one of the bedrocks of um, uh, generating autonomy, well-being, health. But moreover, it's also a question of life and death for many. So the WHO estimates that approximately 300,000 women and girls die annually from complications arising from um, pregnancy and childbirth. And in fact, such complications are the leading cause of death of adolescent girls aged 15 to 19 years. So it's important, I suppose, not only to look at uh, family planning, but also in the context of lower and middle income countries in particular, because 94% of these deaths, preventable deaths, occur in lower and middle income countries. And it is also in these countries where men's power over women's and girls' reproductive bodies is also greatest. So then this brings us to this particular review. Why this particular review? Well, a common criticism of systematic reviews in the field is that generally they concentrate on overall program effectiveness without looking into the specific components of programming or the active ingredients which can make programs effective. And while that was the emphasis in the work that Avni described that we've been doing over the last five years, this was a deeper dive of that particular question in the area of family planning. So the central question or challenge that programmers face is one that we try to address in this systematic review, which is what should programmers include in interventions to engage men and boys in family planning to improve sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. The methods we chose for this review were derived from that aim. And we chose to use a, a method called causal chain analysis. And there are three central principles of this approach. And the first is that it begins with a logic model of drawing out systematically and graphically how we think interventions might work, showing the relationships between program components and program outputs. The method recommends that this logic model is developed in partnership with stakeholders. And so we also did this. We convened a stakeholder group of approximately 30 people working in the Global North and Global South, programmers and researchers, to help us, first of all, define the logic models that inform family planning interventions. And thirdly, causal chain analysis is about not only analyzing the effectiveness of programs, but this deeper dive into what is the what are the effectiveness of specific components and characteristics. And so that is the main central focus of causal chain analysis. And in fact, we were much inspired here by a CEDO paper on this topic. And I think Susie will put the the CEDO paper associated with causal chain analysis into the chat box for the, for the audience as well. Secondly, in terms of our methods, just very briefly to address the literature that we included. Our literature was, was based on a published search strategy derived from our earlier work and published in the protocol for this study. We included experimental evaluation studies and the connected process evaluation papers of these, of, of interventions conducted on family planning in lower and middle income countries. We use literature from the white and gray literature, journal articles, as well as project reports. We applied no language restrictions in the search. And we included all studies that involved men as participants in programming of family planning, which then allowed us to take a deeper look into the types of involvement, 
types of ways that interventions involve men. And Anya will say a little more about this. And we included men and boys of all ages. So now I'd like to hand over to Anya to discuss the preliminary findings. Thank you, Maria. So the findings that I'm going to present you today are preliminary um, because they've not yet undergone a peer review process. So as you can see, we identified 8,895 non-duplicate records, and then we dual screened 3,841 title and abstracts and 280 full texts. So this left us then with 127 records, which were RCTs and quasi-experimental studies. So anyone here who has done a systematic review will understand that dual extracting data on study characteristics, intervention characteristics, um, and multitude of outcomes for 120 studies is very resource intensive. Um, because our resources were finite, <clears throat> excuse me, we needed to make some decisions then regarding um, where these were best directed. So one of the decisions um, that we made was to focus on the central outcome of contraceptive use centrally because it is central to family planning, obviously, but also because it was the most commonly reported outcome, behavioural outcome um, in the included records. So we ended up then with 72 records that reported contraceptive use in the meta-analysis. We also decided in consultation with our advisory group to focus on the mixed methods and causal chain analysis on 34 of these 72 studies, which reported contraceptive use and also had a male engagement co component. So when I say male engagement component, um, what I mean is a component what, that has a substantive aim identified um, in the objectives and procedures. So, you know, while all the studies in the review included men and boys, um, only 44 of them um, had this male engagement component um, and only 34 of them had a male engagement component and um, reported contraceptive use. So male engagement component is, as I said, is then when they have a substantive aim identified in the objectives or procedures to engage men and boys, men or boys, um, in order to impact family planning outcomes. And they might do this, for example, by tailoring the materials or procedures in order to engage men and boys. So what we did was then that we combined these 34 evaluation um, records with 23 connected papers. Um, these connected papers were identified from using the connected papers app. And what they are was um, process evaluations and qualitative studies that were directly linked to those 34 um, male engagement studies. Next slide, please, Maria. So this is just to show you the um, Involve FP review logic model that Maria mentioned earlier on that we developed in consultation with our international advisory group. Um, I'm, uh, there's a lot of detail in it. I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, but it was just to show you how broad it was. Um, and it was intentionally broad to cover as many potential elements of the causal chain as possible. Um, and it was extremely useful throughout the review process and helping us to um, decide on what data to extract um, and also um, to help us to decide um, what way to focus our analysis. Next slide, please, Maria. So, Next, I'm just going to share with you some of the study characteristics. So around half of the 127 included studies were from Africa and the Middle East, as you can see. Um, this was followed then by Asia, um, and then 20% of the studies were um, from the Americas. Next slide, please, Maria. So <clears throat> most participants in the studies, as you can see, were um, mixed age groups. And what commonly was reported was that individuals of reproductive age um, were included in the study. 31% of the studies had adolescents only, um, and 24% had adults only. Move on to the next slide, please, Maria. So just in terms then of how men and boys were involved. Um, so while all, as I said, all 127 studies involve men or boys, as recipients, only 44 of these um, had that um, substantive male engagement component. And because 10 of those um, did not report contraceptive use outcomes, they were not included, only 34 were included in our causal chain analysis. 
only um, a quarter or 31 of the 127 uh, records were gender transformative. That is focusing on addressing gender inequalities and our harmful or restrictive um, gender norms. Um, and a third or 15 of the 44 male engagement studies have this um, gender transformative component. So quite small numbers there um, overall. So next slide, please, Maria. So in relation to our intervention components, then we identified eight components um, overall. Um, and interventions had um, between two and seven um, components, with most of them having multiple um, components as part um, um, of the program. Um, so apologies that the text is quite smaller, but you know, 96% um, of the studies included an information and engagement component. So this really was um, a, what we would understand as education, some kind of information provision. Um, provision. There was 44% of the studies had some kind of social or peer um, or mentor um, support component in it. 40% had a communication component. So that um, is relating to like couple communication or communication um, more broadly in the community and um, perhaps um, having some kind of media um, communication strategy as part um, of the intervention. As I said, 33% had a male engagement component. Another 33% then has some kind of healthcare enhancement um, component as part of the program. 31% um, has some kind of problem solving and skills, kind of workshops, that kind of thing involved. Um, and 27% had, su had subsidized or incentivized contraception or free contraception um, as part of the program. And as I said, 24% then had a gender transformative component. Next slide, please, Maria. In terms of outcomes reported, then, as I said, you can see contraceptive use was the most common. Um, and, and we go down, then we can look at pregnancy, pregnancy timing and desired family size. We've combined these here um, and they were very different in how they were measured across the studies. Um, there was attitudes about contraceptive, um, contraceptives, knowledge about contraceptives, con contraceptives and communication about family planning. There was also outcomes related to service use and equitable decision making about family planning. So final slide then, Maria, please. So Maria asked the question at the start, you know, what should programmers do to engage men and boys in family planning to improve sexual and reproductive health for all? And based on our preliminary findings, these are some of the things that we would suggest. Well, first and foremost, keep involving men and boys. So the evaluated interventions um, that involved men and boys had statistically significantly higher odds of improving contraceptive use when compared to comparison groups. So groups who received the family plan interventions were one and a third times more likely than those in the comparison groups to experience improved contraceptive use. It's important to understand here that all including studies involve men and boys. So we're not comparing um, those that did um, involve men and boys with those that did not. So the comparison groups generally were, um, you know, practice as usual or waitlisted control. Um, but it is possible that some of those um, comparison groups involve men and boys. So what we can say, though, is that these interventions that were included in this review um, were effective in improving contraceptive use. So the second thing then to focus on is to continue this focus on education. So I mentioned information and education um, as one of the components and that most of the interventions included those. But this was in fact the only component that was significantly associated with improved contraceptive use. Multiple, intervent or multiple components are also important though for programmers to remember. So the other components, um, such as subsidized or free contraception, health service enhancement, and gender transformative um, components had non-significant positive effects. Um, but they were still showing some um, movement in terms of their impact. And I should say that in the, um, in the causal chain analysis and the qualitative studies that we looked at as well, coupled communication um, and joint decision-making about family plan were considered, considered central um, in qualitative analysis, as was well communication more broadly in the community. And that really emerged as really important. So the message is that multiple components are important. Education is key and uh, additional multiple components also. So programmers should also use community-based educational designs 
um, in their study. So that also emerged um, as a really important um, um, predictor um, in terms of um, the influence of family and wider social networks, cultural norms and social stigma also emerged as really important whenever we looked at the barriers and facilitators. Another key point is that, you know, as well as including men in these programmes, we need to continue to um, include women as well. Um, and that emerged as a really important finding. So only the only um, interventions that had dual recipients um, emerged as effective predictors of contraceptive use. The studies included in this review that had only males um, did not emerge as effective predictors of contraceptive use. So finally, then um, we would suggest that there, this review would suggest that programmers um, need to, to continue to intervene across the life course. So whenever we look at the different way, the different recipients of the interventions in terms of whether they were delivered adolescents only, adults only, or the mixed groups, um, all of these um, emerge as predict as effective predictors of contraceptive use. That's it for me. Thanks very much. Many thanks to Maria and Douanier. Uh, I will hand over, please, to Ravi. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks very much. Let me share my screen a little bit. Can you see my screen, please? We can't, Ravi. Is Would you like me? We can't see your slides. Screen. And now I'm sharing this. Has it come? I'm afraid not. Do you want me to try for you? Oh, OK. Wait a minute, let me just... Come on, try, okay. All right, go ahead and share. Okay. Uh, Susie, I'm sorry. Okay, put the screen. So thank you very much, Patrick. What I'm going to do is to uh, make a a presentation of a study that we undertook uh, at ICRW recently, uh, together with our partner, uh, Human Centric Design uh, uh, partner, Vihara. And this presentation I'm making on behalf of my team and the teams from the partner organization. Next, please. The project, in fact, aimed to uh, develop and validate gender equitable approaches uh, on male and couple engagement in family planning uh, with a focus on birth spacing, largely drawing from human-centric design and exploratory review of evidence. Next, please. Well, while we began the journey by uh, focusing on men, we soon realized that we must work with couples. And one of the reasons, key reasons uh, was that family is imagined in, in our context and I think most context as a heteropatriarchal space where a biological men and with a women and uh, and children born out of that union, uh, very rarely does this recognize, or in fact, it does not recognize non-normative uh, gender and sexual identities. And this kind of imagination has defined uh, the family planning program uh, largely, uh, which, uh, which really goes on to define the scope of uh, and focus of policy and programs and research. I think and that means there is um, a tremendous risk if we engage, we begin to engage men with that perspective, we would be uh, helping to privilege them or we'll be privileging them more um, in a patriarchal, deeply patriarchal societies. Uh, 
and for a gender transformative program, it is it is important that we begin to question these privileges right from the beginning. That's the lens that we use to to define these programs. Next, please. So we undertook over a period of about two years in four phases. The in the first phase of the work, we uh, we uh, did the review, programmatic review, academic peer reviewed. Uh, publications. Uh, we did review of HCD program as well. We interviewed, uh, you know, program uh, personnel, some of the known program uh, personnel and their uh, representatives to get an insight as to what they were doing. And we have produced the knowledge products which are there on our website and we'll give you the, uh, we'll share that. In the second phase, we took a deep immersion in, in six study sites in UP and Bihar to look at the journey of men and women couples uh, on you know, uh, trying to understand and deconstruct uh, the, uh, the family planning decision-making process. It was an ethnographic uh, piece, which, which we then combined with the, uh, with the evidence review and synthesized and um, and they they were done largely through reflect, reflective workshops. You know, we we did a lot of meetings and discussions together to to piece these two pieces together. And in the third phase, we developed theory of change, and and very uh, strategic that led to developing about thirteen intervention directions, and uh, and then based on that. Uh, we uh, so validated some of those uh, intervention directions in the field. The, uh, we could not do a complete validation, but rapid research, but we did uh, go back to the field to check on the on validating those intervention directions and ideas that I'll share very quickly. We also undertook a rapid review, uh, rapid research on the impact of COVID-19 on family planning landscape at this point in time. Uh, knowing that how this has deepened the gender dimensions and uh, how uh, some of those has far reaching implications when we begin to look at the engagement of men uh, within the structural uh, uh, framework that was that is changing that is changing economic relations and a lot of decision making processes at every level so we undertook that study please next please so some of the key learnings, next please. Uh, <clears throat> are in fact, broadly there are five uh, kind of domains within which we have conceptually bucketed our, uh, our findings and, and that led to the development of intervention designs. The one is whole domain of sexuality and how it is driven by gendered power play, defines the engagement. The spousal communication and and how uh, it is important to understand the emotional uh, the relation intimacy intimacy within the partners to negotiate norms and mass norms around masculinity, sex, and fertility. This strong son preference that defines men's engagement in this entire process uh, of uh, whether to cho choosing for a contraceptive or going for a, uh, for a fertility decisions. And, and then we uh, found how knowledge acquisition and knowledge production, knowledge creation that is itself so gendered at the family and the community level where men become the gatekeeper. So, uh, and the health system, the fifth, which is not mentioned here, Bullet, is the health system uh, is not really adequate or is not uh, <clears throat> uh, equipped to address the issue of, of gender from the transformative lens. So next, please. So largely, uh, I'll just make a quick point on, on this, how sexuality is driven by gendered uh, power play. Uh, we know that we in, in our systematic, uh, in our uh, reviews in immersion studies, we found that men's sexual expressions is largely an extension of how they feel in other spheres of life. Pleasure is completely absent in that discourse. In fact, sexuality is driven by the idea of control. And that 
is so much central to the um, to the idea of man, being a man, being a masculine person, de defining their relationship, and uh, it gets displayed in every aspects of the relationship and life. So this is something that any program that needs to address the engagement of men uh, into the process of decision making needs to keep in mind and, and begin to think how to address this. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, important because in the couple space, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, our interviews and, and um, insights from the field does, did suggest that uh, the little gestures and moments uh, have set big milestones in the lives of couples uh, and define their relationship. And a lot of the time, they just do not know how to communicate and what to communicate around family planning issues, about the contraceptives. And there is a need to bring in an element of uh, emotional intimacy as a key, which is used as a key um, format to negotiate some of those norms around masculinity and power between, between the couples. Uh, and it's important to remember that as, as uh, something that would determine the intervention directions. So next, please. So this is what uh, where the mostly first birth is early and unplanned due to the social pressures as well as the couple's perceived need to prove their fertility and man's virility. So lack of communication adds to this whole complexity and pressure eases only after the first birth, particularly if, if it is a case of son. We have demonstrated in other studies a strong link between sun preference and, and the mass idea of, of masculinity and power. Uh, most men uh, were aware that the desire for upward mobility, education, and financial stability for the children creates high intent for spacing among couples. Couples shared goals and individual aspirations and desire to lead better, comfortable lives themselves and for their children did make them consider their family size and timing of birth. So there is a there is uh, a clear understanding of the financial responsibility of raising a child and perception of current financial stability affect the timing of the next child. So there is uh, a, a consciousness, but, but uh, it's, they are unable to deal with the social and familial pressure uh, because of the reasons of strong sun preference and proving their virility. So, so that this needs to be built into the program. So next, please. Uh, this is uh, how men, uh, we have seen men are, um, are key sources of information on contraceptive as well as gatekeepers of information for women. Incomplete knowledge or, or only women possessing knowledge further adds to the power imbalance between the couple as men perceive it as an inadequacy on their part. And this is important. So. We have seen how smartphones have become highly accessible and accessed by, by uh, lots of people as a medium of information, largely by men. And there are constant uh, exchange of information using this medium uh, between, uh, between couples. Uh, and this enhanced knowledge to address the unique need of couples at appropriate points in their life trajectory has the capacity of building agency and trust within the relationship but it needs to be addressed in a manner where men not only it's not only men who control over these resources and become the filter for the information knowledge but women also become uh, the primary uh, source of seeking information through, through many of these media okay next so ravi just a quick pointer on timing if you could uh... last so this is uh, so how we develop the typologies of couples from sole consultative to collaborative decision making couples we have next please um, and develop intervention directions we have identified those intervention directions at many levels within the eco eco framework next please 
and text curated many target targeted solutions through the uh, toolkits that we the team prepared couple making toolkit young fathers network next uh, you know scenario based training of frontline workers relationship coach through these uh, digital means so yes so the entire idea of this research was to really uh, research using human centric uh, design approach was to really take a deeper dive into what are the barriers for uh, for or what are the critical points around which the intervention should be conceptualized when we begin to engage men so that they don't reinforce the uh, the existing hierarchy of or the privilege uh, of of men but they create the equal field for both uh, men and women within within that couple relationship next please so these are some of the products that we have uh, we have uh, produced they are available on our website we are looking forward to the next steps in testing out some of these intervention directions they are very interesting that what 13 intervention directions um, that uh, uh, really define uh, how some of the interventions and research should be undertaken um, in in the next generation work i would really have, I would like to share this with Avni and the WHO team when we are looking at the set of research questions for the next phase of your work to see how best to take some of that, some of these insights forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm sorry if I've exceeded the time. Thank you very much, Ravi, and to all the presenters. So, sorry, I had to speed you up slightly at the end. I'm just a little bit conscious of time. Um, I wonder if if the other presenters might rejoin us on the screen if they haven't yet. So we have everybody everybody present for the discussion. That would be much appreciated. Um, and perhaps uh, if you'll permit me, I'll begin with the first question, and then we can look at the questions that have come in through the, the chat from the from the audience uh, to open up the discussion. I, th I think that perhaps the the question that occurred to me listening to you and, and looking at what you shared yesterday. Um, is around the issues of, of generalizability. So how, how far do you think that the findings from the work that you've presented applies beyond the particular populations that studies have been done in? I realize there's very different scope for the different presentations, um, but that, that's an interesting question, I think, for, for all uh, presenters. Um, how much does an understanding of, of, of the why and the for whom around interventions help to address issues of, of generalizability. Um, and I think maybe particularly for the Queen's University team, I'd be interested to know whether the causal chain analysis helps you if you think that was useful in that respect. Um, so maybe to initially start with Maria and Nonye and then pass on to Ravi and, and Avni, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, to address the generalizability question first, um, what was interesting for us actually was, even though we use different methods for the different reviews that we've been involved in over the years, Avni, when we came to this one on using causal chain analysis, the end results are rather similar to the results that we found in our review of the overall field. Um, so you'll find that, for example, we mentioned again, multi-component um, points. The multi-level one, again, was largely absent from our review. The, you know, the, the focus on, on a multi-level approach has not been fully kind of interrogated really in, in, in interventions. And it may be where we're, um, how we're developing interventions um, at, at, at uh, a population level or small population levels rather than large population levels. The finding of men and women came out in both reviews. And in ours, the finding, in the initial reviews, it was the finding of longer duration. And in this review, it, it, it emerged as across the life course, which is essentially also kind of a longer duration um, finding. So there's a great deal of overlap between the findings in the SRHR field in general and specifically around family planning. And then 
as to how we found the causal chain analysis. Well, we found it damnable complicated, to be totally honest with you. <laughs> it was not easy to use uh, in, in many respects. And um, so the opening logic model was, um, you know, very straightforward, very, you know, very helpful because that, that made sense. That was easy in lots of ways. The involvement of a large um, advisory group was terrific. And some of them are on the line here today. Though it's interesting when you have a very large advisory group, then you try to put everything that everybody says up on the logic model. So it becomes actually harder to discern what the key, you know, a very small hypothesis or very defined hypotheses that you might actually test because you don't want to go away from the global look. You, you know, you, you, your fear of, of excluding some views, points and so on. So that's a balance to be drawn on that kind of work. And then the, the finally on the causal chain analysis was very useful to try and focus the mind in on analyzing the effectiveness of components. But sometimes then you get down to very small numbers of studies with those components and so on. So you start off with a large group of studies and then you, you send some of the analysis, for, say for example, the gender transformative piece where there's some questions coming in. Essentially, we only had nine studies there that had gender transformative and male engagement and contraceptive use uh, examined. So great, but complicated, and uh, but worth getting down into that nitty gritty. And in a way, in a nutshell, causal chain analysis is trying to quantify some of the things you might do qualitatively in a realist approach in a qualitative and um, systematic review. So that, that would, those would be my thoughts on, on, the, on those matters. Uh, uh, me, uh, Patrick, in the sequence, yes, See you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No, I, I think the, our observations, our findings around those four domains have a strong internal validity. You know, I, you're talking about external generalizations, but the fact that the issue of sexuality is at the core of masculinity and does reflect in relationships and needs to be addressed if you want to engage in a transformative program, then that needs to be recognized. I mean, that's, a, and it's generalizable um, uh, by any imagination. I think you, if you just link it, the kind of quantitative studies show the linkage between contraceptive use and gender transformative programs, they, they are limited in, in the manner they can really dig into some of these upstream uh, issues of how masculinity transforms or translates itself in, in relationships and then into a decision-making process. You know, the idea about spousal communication and emotional intimacy within the relationship was so profound in those immerse, immersive investigations that we did. None of the studies quantitatively captured would be able to cap, uh, capture the relationship of that kind with contraceptive use as an outcome and then say that it is generalized. I think I would rather put my money and my bet and my faith into the programs that are far more deep, deeper, they're contextually relevant, they, they are realistic rather than, and not obsessed with the generalization for the sake of scale and not have any impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. I would think there's a time to do a hard conversation on these issues on male engagement. All this time, it has been very tokenistic. I think a lot of research which has gone into this have to be re-looked at from the perspective of what transformation means, what does gender transformative means. Uh, we have not seen this. Uh, for us, gender transformative programming should really be addressing issues around uh, how men are really uh, conflicted between their role as pro provider and protector and, and as their role as control, you know, uh, as someone who believes in uh, the economic liabilities of families. So they are, we, we have seen uh, that men are also conflicted in, in, in the journey of uh, dealing in their personal relationship as part of their masculine uh, expectations uh, that come onto them, pressures that come onto them and, and their own personal desires. In the, 
and that gets translated into personal relationships in the families. Now, any program, if that does not even look at this and does not address this, then it's not transformative. So my sense is that most of this, this glossing over the transformative program reviews through some of the variable based reviews and, 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 and quantitative relationships don't really capture those, uh, those inner dynamics of transformation, which is needed in the male engagement program. So we have to move beyond tokenism, Patrick. And that's what my purpose was. That was my purpose was to show that look, uh, in these six sites, the studies done within the lives of people does throw up some of the insights that are so generalizable in any patriarchal society. You could really see that these are intimately linked to the man's being, man's identity, man's own, uh, you know, uh, idea of proving oneself in Thank everything you. that one does, a <laughs> man does. So Thank yes, you. That's a, that's Thank a, that's you. A... Let's let's invite Avni in. I think uh, both potentially to respond and uh, to the initial question and to the discussion. Please, Avni. Thank you, Ravi. I think uh, maybe just to maybe summarize what Ravi and uh, also Maria have said. You know, I think part of the problem and challenges we face with the generalizability question is what I call the problem of trying to put a round peg in a square hole, right? So the, the gender transformation process is, is very socially complex, uh, multi-level, multi-generational, you know, takes time. It, it requires a social change process. And what we have uh, with these systematic review methodologies is a very reductionist uh, quantitative epidemiological methods that we are forced to use using RCTs, using quasi-experimental methods that don't always do justice to the social, com, you know, complex social change process. So, and, and social change processes are always, always context specific. So it's, it's extremely hard, I think, with the tools we have to answer the question of generalizability for something like this. Uh, and I think that's the problem we always run into. It's not unique to gender transformation. I think in general, in public health, we need to really challenge the applicability of some of these methods. That being said, I, as Maria said, have been remarkably surprised that when we have done these systematic review processes on this issue over and over and over again, uh, whether we are querying family planning as, as Maria and Aine have done, or whether we have looked at the same methods for looking at violence prevention outcomes or family, uh, maternal and child health outcomes, it is quite remarkable that what's coming through over and over again is multi-component and working with men and women. Intuitively, it makes complete sense. I mean, just logically, if you think how social change around norms happens, of course, why would you only work with women or why would you only work with men? And why would you assume that social change and behavior change is driven by one or two uh, intervention components? But now we have across all of these different reviews, uh, across different outcomes in sexual reproductive health, remarkable similar, similarity in the, gen, you know, the generalizability of these findings, that this is what we need to bring about social change around masculinities and norms. So I, I, I hope that that answers at least some of the questions that you've been trying to grapple with. I think we really need to query the methodology issues, as well as Lord, the fact that we still have come to the same place, no matter what. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. I, w I wonder maybe whether the, the, the Queen's University team uh, would like to speak a little bit to the, the issue of, of measurement, the definition and measurement of gender transformative work. It also picks up on a question asked by Tim in the Q&A around how, it, how it's measured, how it's assessed. Um, so I just wonder whether it would be helpful to come back, to, um, not to put you on the spot particularly to, to uh, have to defend one particular approach, but just to pick up on the question of how, how it was defined and measured and whether you see limitations to that in, in, the, in the systematic review. Anya, shall I let you speak on this one? 
Sure. So, so I suppose what how gender transformative was so gender transformative was a component um, within um, and that focus on discussing you know gender inequalities and norms and things like that. But the measure, um, which was you know not just one obviously across studies it was different measured of us, but it was attitudes and beliefs um, about gender inequalities. Really, was what the studies measured, um, as is always the case across. Um, these studies, they were variable in relation to how those were measured. Um, and I and I was reading um, Tim's question, and I think it's it's an important question, and they're really good things to think about and for us to consider. So I think that's one thing that we can do with this review is to look at how these things were measured and question how these things were measured. Um, I can hold those up, I suppose, for examination, um, and that's the advantage of of um, you know um, having our advisory group on board and also involved in these qualitative studies um, as part of the review process as well, because it allows us to look at you know their thinking behind that so one of the things that that Tim had asked was about you know how these were measured they were as expected mostly at the individual level um, and I mean I don't have the exact figures in front of me but my understanding and taking part in the analysis um, is that um, mostly it was you know there was a mixture of these were you know and uh, relate back to the participants of the study either men only um, responses in relation to these because you know generally that's what was trying to be addressed and changing you know um, men's attitudes and beliefs I guess um, but there were studies in there that um, collected data from men and women as well. Um, there was an also a question that Tim had asked and it's related I think in relation to joint decision making and how we um, define that and how that's measured within these studies and it's not something I have in front of me. It's not something that I have in the forefront of my head at the moment. But as I said, really important questions for us to examine um, as part of our writing up of this report. Um, joint decision making, you know, and, and I relate to what Tim is saying in relation to its meaning for um, different participants. I mean, the measures in these studies are, are limited. You know, you're always going to be limited in terms of, um, you know, um, a basic question, you know, who makes the decisions about family planning, you know, and the men might say, oh, it's joint decision making, and the women might say, um, oh, my husband makes the decisions. And it is getting into the nitty gritty of what is joint decision making? I mean, is it just, you know, that simple question or is it something more? I think we probably all agree that it is obviously something more. Um, and it's something that all the rest of the panelists have been um, have mentioned also. So often a bit of a, a, a bit of a wonder there, but I mean, I think that that is one of the things that we can contribute in relation to this review is to examine those things closer and look at how they're measured. Um, and that would be valuable information, I think, for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we have two more specific questions in, in the chat that we perhaps have time to get through uh, before I hand back to Avni for a final summing up. Um, one, one is a specific question for Ravi around access to cell phones. So how important was women's access to cell phones and what was the socioeconomic status of, of the couples you work with in the study? And if I may just also give the second question because then we could pass straight on um, from Joanna, which I think is a question to the Queen's team. Um, how many studies used participatory design on the intervention or a continue, continual participatory process through the intervention implementation? So maybe if you wouldn't mind the, the, the two teams picking up those, those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm, can I go first quickly? Uh, <coughs> thanks. So yes, uh, right. Uh, the access to cell phone is, uh, is less uh, among women, that's well known, but it is increasing, you know, in, in many ways the mobile phones uh, have become the reality and and they have begun to use and this is the time when the information can be uh, truly uh, tailored to the uh, to the lifestyle of women uh, within the families uh, where you know they can use this information so i think and that's why the couple approach is is very important for us that's what we thought you know we knew and we know this very well 
that men have greater access to these resources and therefore the knowledge becomes so gendered they bring in the information and they pass it on to their wives uh, on contraceptives so to break that nexus i think it's important to take the opportunity growing opportunity of increasing access to mobile phones and and other uh, platform many other platform it says since the multiple level uh, interventions that we were looking at from structural point of view we were looking at other sources of information for women so as far as social and economic background is concerned we had uh, couples from from range of uh, social and economic background, not only confined to the ones who are disadvantaged or who had less, uh, who are only in resource poor settings, but they were uh, across uh, urban and, and rural areas, semi-urban areas. So, but differential access existed everywhere, differential sources of knowledge existed uh, everywhere. But, and, and in that context, these observations are, are pretty much generalizable uh, to to, to this. Okay, thank you, thank you. And maybe maybe to uh, Maria and Onye to respond to the other, the second question. Onye, would you like to take that one? Sure, I can, yes. So um, I don't have that information. We did extract information on that. So thank you for the question. And it's certainly something we can um, examine more closely. Um, I don't have it in front of me at the moment. M my knowledge of the studies that's involved would say that that was fairly minimal um, in terms of a participatory approach um, across the board. But that is just off the top of my head. But we will have that information um, available. So I'm um, certainly and endeavor to report that. Thank you. Um, Avni, if you, if you don't mind, I think we have a, a few more minutes and we'd asked you uh, to kindly bring some closing thoughts. I think probably now is a good time if you're happy to just uh, share a few closing thoughts uh, with the group. And then, we, then we, I will, well, I'll begin now maybe by thanking all the presenters uh, and all the participants for the discussion and for the questions, which have been interesting. Um, so maybe to hand over to Avni for, for final reflections. Sure, uh, I'll focus on four points, uh, which I was really struck by the similarities, both in terms of Aine and uh, uh, Maria's overview presentation of, at, of the global sort of thing and Ravi's deep dive into the study. <laughs> And what really sort of struck me is, you know, we are actually getting increasingly sophisticated, not quite, but increasingly in our knowledge and understanding of the complex world of gender norms and power relations, you know, in, in intimate relationships. So we're getting there and I, I, I can see, you know, just how much sort of knowledge compared to 20 years ago or 10 years ago, even five years ago, we're, we're actually beginning to to synthesize and even uh, sort of dig deeper into. But that being said, it's very clear from all of the questions that came into the chat box that there are many, many, many gaps and knowledge gaps in you know, really understanding what is a very, very complex decision-making process over the life course between in, within at the individual level, but within relationships and what is the social influence on these different decisions and behaviors. So I think we, we need to really kind of do a little bit more. I think the third thing that we really need to grapple with is how, what do we do in, in unpacking, measuring, evaluating what are socially complex and upstream interventions. And I you know, feel that the methodological toolbox that we have or that is valued and validated and privileged in public health is often limited. And I think we need to now really unpack and expand that methodological toolbox and start valuing and appreciating and validating other ways to actually unpack what is effective and why in this complex sort of, in this world of complex social interventions, because gender transformation cannot be re reduced to you know, quantitative measures of decision-making 
It cannot be reduced to one or two components of social change. It happens at so many complex levels. And unfortunately, you know, we haven't shifted our paradigm from that very narrow clinical biomedical, you know, uh, RCT uh, uh, to, to really thinking, well, what are the tools and what are the toolboxes that we should privilege when we actually try to unpack this complex process of gender transformation? Um, and and that, that's why we're stuck with all of this. The quality is low. We don't have direct impact. We can't show impact on the uh, health outcomes, the biomedical outcomes that often are, are the ones that are privileged. And even we can't show within two year time frame whether some behaviors have stuck or changed, but we can't because the societal context in which most of these people go back after the intervention is completed is changing, it's evolving. Um, and we, we don't, I mean, our donors are funding us for RCTs that last for six months, 12 months and 24 months if you're lucky. What happens after five years, we have no idea. So I think that we really need to think through, you know, what is appropriate now to measure the gender transformation processes and, and what sticks beyond these two year periods. And I'll stop here. I think that's, that's a, a, a fantastic way to sum up the questions and issues looking forwards. Um, and, and I think we are just at time. So I think, thank you, Avni, for summing up. Thank you to all of the participants. I found this myself a very interesting and informative discussion. I hope that uh, everybody else did as well. It will be recorded, uh, online available, and, and the documents uh, Susie has shared into the chat. I think links will be also be on the website. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at, at future Settle webinars. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ravi. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.